Hi guys, Mark Dawes NFPS Limited, and this is gonna be a relatively short video, but it's a really important video for those of you out there that are delivering training courses, particularly in use of force and restraint. And this is really also important for those of you that commission training out there that are gonna buy in training. There's been a couple of cases in the press recently which you are probably aware of, but if you're not, I'm gonna go through them anyway, and you can read about them below the video. So if you're watching this on our blog site, all the text of the case is below the video. If you're looking at this on YouTube, click on the link, it'll take you through to the blog site and you can see all the text there. Well, recently, the Supreme Court gave a ruling that the families of soldiers who were killed in action in Iraq can sue the Ministry of Defence for negligence. And one family of a red cap, a Royal Military Policeman, who was killed in Iraq uh, after being set about by a mob, are now pursuing that. They're actually going to sue the mob for negligence. The basis of their claim is that their son was in Iraq with insufficient ammunition and old kit that didn't work. They were outnumbered, with no means of protecting themselves in a known area that was, that was hostile, and as a result of that, they died. And that is a breach of Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which all government authorities and public authorities must enforce, which is the positive obligation to promote and preserve the right to life. And they're taking this action on the basis that the government failed. They were negligent in sending them out there with a lack of ammunition and, and lack of kit and old kit that was, that was not fit for purpose. Now, that has a bearing on what we do as restraint trainers and for those of us that commission training, because we have to make sure that the training is fit for purpose, the resources are there, and any kit, if it is to be used, is fit for purpose. Another case I want to talk to you about is where a farmer now has been charged with gross negligent manslaughter by the Crown Prosecution Service because a member of the public was killed whilst walking on a public footpath when he was actually trampled on by one of the animals that the farmer owned. And they are prosecuting for gross negligence manslaughter on the basis that it's in the public interest to do so. Now, what does all this mean for those of us that actually teach restraint or commission training or any use of force skill? Well, first and fundamentally, you know, restraint is an activity that carries a inherent degree of risk. Let's look at restraint or self-defense, but particularly restraint. Human rights has to be at the core of what we do there because you know, there, there are a number of things out there which can increase the risk of death. But we have organizations out there teaching techniques that do not work. I mean, there's no other way to cut this one. The techniques don't work. They don't meet the principles of what a skill is defined as because they're too complicated, there's too many component parts, they're taught in an extrapolated way. And at the end of the day, staff have difficulty in being able to, to learn the techniques, let alone remember them and recall them. Now, if that's happening in a training course, and then you're going to put those staff that can't do it on a training course into a real life environment where they're going to have to try and do something that they can't do in a training course. I mean, you know, the writing's on the wall. This, this is not logic. And you can actually create a line of causation back to the trainer to say that that won't work. This is old style training. This bit drill type training is old style training. And there are better ways and much more functional ways of doing that now. So that's one thing that we can address straight away. Another issue, and I was just checking my notes here, so forgive me, but another issue is that we still have staff who are being taught to restrain on their own. You know, they're being told, this is the way we work. You know, put up with it, basically. You're going to be taught to restrain on your own, and you're going to have to restrain on your own, because that's the way it is. I've covered this on other videos, restraining on your own is a lone working activity, it carries a inherent degree of risk and it shouldn't be done, the correct resources should be in place. Now equipment, let's come on to equipment. You know, I know this is going to upset a few people, but when we talk about things like handcuffs or emergency response belts or soft cuffs or other, other restraint equipment, the initial response we get from a lot of organisations is you know, they stand back in disbelief because they say you can't do that because it's inhumane. You know, it's, it's degrading at best and putting handcuffs on, on someone, a member of the public or a patient, we just shouldn't do it. Yet these very same organisations have restraints going on with these very same patients from five to eight hours. Their staff doing shift handovers during restraint. Now tell me that that's not degrading. What the law says, which is quite clear, uh, particularly on the manual handling side, is where you can actually, if you like, take away the, the physical manual handling aspect of it by having an automated or mechanical process, then that's what you should do. It's in the manual handling operations guidance notes. And, and if you're coming on a course with us, you'll get all this information anyway and we'll give you all the notes. But you can download them off the HSC website, I'm sure. So if you've got a manual ha handling activity taking place, which restraint is, and you can actually 
take away the physical aspect of staff having to do it by having a mechanical or an automated process, you should do that. So that's where you know, handcuffs come in. So objectively, you can look at this and you can actually start saying, well, let's consider the options here. There are still training courses out there, by the way, that are teaching techniques that were advised not to be taught as far away as 13 years ago. Old school stuff. So if you look at these two cases, particularly the one with the red caps, where you've, you've got soldiers being put into a position where there's a known risk to life, with old kit, lack of ammunition or lack of resources, and they die, and the Supreme Court has now given the families the right to sue the Ministry of Defence for negligence based on the, on the fact that the Ministry of Defence failed to promote and preserve the right to life of soldiers in the war zone, the defence that the Ministry of Defence had, which was this thing called combat immunity, is now being seriously challenged. And in fact, it's, it's starting to diminish. We can no longer have the, it goes with the job attitude, you know, it's part of the job. You're going to have to restrain on your own because that's the way we work. That is going to go. Human rights legislation has to be at the core of everything we do in a use of force and restraint training program. It's absolutely empirical. And these should be identified in the risk assessments and the correct resources put in place. Now, this isn't difficult to do. I mean, we've been doing it for years. In fact, we started working with the Human Rights Act five years before the Human Rights Act came into force. We could see the, the importance of this, and we got lawyers in to advise us on this stuff. So when you train with us, you'll see how all this fits together, how we join the dots up, and we'll give you all the risk assessments. But if you're not going to train with us, please go and look at this, because these cases are current, and it won't take long before there'll be a case in a restraint-related death where the same principles will be applied. Now, the other day I was speaking at a conference and someone, someone asked me, they said, well, what's the point in changing because no one yet really has been that seriously prosecuted? The point in changing is because it's the right thing to do. Nothing more than that. People in our industry talk about ethics, they talk about moralities, but they're not willing to change. They rely on what's called the Nuremberg Defence. Now, if you don't know what the Nuremberg Defence is, go back to the Second World War, and at the end of the war, a lot of the Nazis, particularly the, the, the more um, senior officers, were, were imprisoned in Nuremberg, and they were put on trial, and they were hung, and some committed suicide. Their defence was this, we were following orders. They knew what they were doing was wrong, but they were following orders. By that very same token, you can't say, well, that's the system and we have to teach it because that's the system. If the system is wrong, you need to make representation and raise this. And by the way, if your system is so-called approved, but it's using techniques that actually contradict the positive obligation to preserve life, and some of these techniques like prone, supine, if they're not needed, should, should actually be eliminated from use. If it's been approved, and we've heard this by the way, we can't remove any of these techniques. If we remove the techniques, the system will no longer be approved. Well, here's a wake-up call for you. If your approved system is actually based on using techniques that shouldn't be in in the first place, then your approval system isn't worth a carrot. It won't stand up in a court of law. We have to change. Risk assessment should be at the hub of everything you do, and the Human Rights Act should be at the core of everything you do. These are two really important principles. Now, if you're training with us in September, and we'd love to see you there. You will see how all this fits together. If you're not training with us, that's absolutely fine. There's loads of other information on our website about this. There's loads of videos on our YouTube channel about this. Go and have a look. And if we can be of any help and assistance to you, drop us an email or pick up the phone. But please, you know, below this video are, are the text of those two cases I spoke about and the implications for us as use of force trainers. Please take the time to read it. And if, like I said, if you have any questions, please get back to me. Thanks very much for listening, and if you're coming on the Restraint Instructors course in September, we'll see you there. If you're thinking about coming, by the way, there's only now three places left, so please book on uh, as soon as you can if you're intending to come but haven't sent your booking form in yet, because the next course will not be till March 2014. And by the way, we've got some really, really interesting information for those of you that are coming in September, which we haven't released yet, um, but you'll be the first to hear about it when you come on the September Restraint Instructors course, or if you attend the Refresher course in September too. That's going to be hot off the press, um, and we look forward to letting you know about it. That's all for now, guys. Thanks ever so much for listening, and I'll speak to you soon.